Hello, welcome to Global AI Bootcamp. Very excited to be part of this conference. I wish I could be there in person, but hopefully next time. Today we'll be talking about next generation functional and visual testing powered by AI. Before I start with the session, a quick note of thanks to the organizing team and the sponsors for making this happen. A little bit about me uh, before we jump into the topic. I'm Anand Bagmar. I'm a tester by heart. I've been in the software quality space for more than 20 years now. I've worked with various product and services organizations across the globe and played various different roles along this journey with the sole purpose of how can I help build a better quality product. I am a Selenium contributor. I'm part of the Selenium and Appium and Agile India communities. I help organize those events as well. Along with open source contribution and helping on the organizing side, I blog, I do my consulting uh, in areas of quality. And you can reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn or from my website if you would like to talk more about the topic today or just collaborate and interact on aspects of quality and discuss that. So enough about myself, let's jump into the topic itself. Today, teams are doing a lot of automation of various different sorts. The test automation pyramid is not a new concept. And with this, it gives us insights into what different types of automation can be done on the product to get quicker feedback about its quality and hopefully take better decisions, quick decisions to make the product quality better and reduce the impact on the end users. The test automation pyramid of course has got various different types of tests that can be applicable for your product. As we go from bottom to top of the pyramid, the number of tests should reduce because the feedback cycle is slower uh, as you do that. Also, there's more integration required. The environment setup needs to be complete in order to run the top layer of the tests. The lower layers have got direct access to the code or granular components of the code. And you can test the quality of that individual granular code much more quickly and get the feedback. But it is all these types of tests combined together which tell you the quality of the product. Just having one type of test is not going to be sufficient for you. But along with the regular tests that you have which will test the functionality and the implementation details. You would also have various different types of NFRs that would be required to get a better sense of quality of your product in terms of load and volume when it is used by real users out in production. So some of the NFRs are listed here. Of course, there could be many more depending on context of your product, like performance, security, accessibility, analytics, validations, and various others. But what this means is there are various different types of automated tests that combine tell you the quality of your product. However, even if you have done all of these tests, you would still see that defects escape into production. And this is because the traditional automated testing approach are not built for modern apps for the modern requirements. And traditional, I'm not talking 20 years back, it is still uh, the last 10, 15 years where we have evolved to start using continuous integration and start hopefully start moving towards continuous delivery. But uh, so our ways have evolved, our tools, technologies, practices have evolved, but still it is not yet suitable for the modern apps for the pace at which we want to release our apps, our products uh, to the consumers. And you will see these defects escaping in various different types of products, whether it is uh, a Southwest airline uh, app where OS upgrade has caused some uh, visual issues. Uh, the fields are there, but you're not able to see those over here. So it's a problem for the end user. 
It could be a banking app where the screens are not laid out correctly. There's some styling issues. That could be the aspect. Uh, it could be music apps, streaming apps, where again, there's overlapping content over there, uh, which is a problem. It could be simple issues like alignment. In this particular example, this is not as big a problem as uh, the earlier ones that we've seen. At least the user is able to see that they need to enter the password and reconfirm the password. It could be uh, another airline example where there is in the menu uh, bar itself, there's overlapping content. If you see the mobile web version of this particular website, it's still the main website of a desktop website, which is rendered in the mobile. So it makes the user experience really bad for uh, the people who want to try and use your product. Another few examples, this is a UPS app where uh, when opened on a iPad or a tablet, the rendering is completely messed up. It could be a media website where the longer content is overlapping into the main uh, content of the article itself. And these are different problems. One last example, here's an Amazon example where during a big sale that was launched, instead of seeing the revenues and the transaction increase, the team figured out that uh, actually the trend is going lower, the revenue and interactions with the product is getting lesser. And quickly they figured out that when they did the deployment, the CSS was broken. Now, why do these types of issues escape? There is a lot of commonality in all these different examples that we have seen. The commonality is you would have probably done a lot of testing, a lot of automation on these, any type of product, whether it's a B2B product, B2C product, it's a website, mobile web, native apps, it does not matter. You do a lot of testing, automated testing on these, and your automated testing would pass in most of these scenarios anyway, because it's functional testing. It is based on locators and doing actions on those uh, particular elements. And your automation tools would most likely pass uh, the test uh, for all of these examples. But it's the user experience that is getting impacted. The end user is not able to purchase a ticket or play the music. Uh, in some cases, not able to book uh, tickets or uh, whatever the transactions need to happen, right? Is the end user who's getting impacted. And even if there is no severe impact, there is a problem because they would not be sure if they should proceed using the product to seeing all the visual issues that are there. So why do these types of products escape to production? If you really think about it, it escapes, uh, these issues escape because our approach to testing is incorrect. And I'll tell you why this uh, approach is incorrect. It is because we end up doing the same mundane activities over and over again. And it's a tedious uh, thing, right? Now, if you have to repeat the same activity, your mind is going to get tired doing the same thing over and over again. You are always running against time. You always have limited time when to get testing completed before you need to release a product. And because of the tedious nature running against time, it is bound to create uh, errors in the humans who are testing. And uh, hence, you end up releasing these issues to production. If you had time, of course, none of these would go uh, live because a lot of these were obvious problems, but they went live to production. That means there was something wrong in that, right? And the reason these issues escape to production is in addition to the aspects mentioned on screen is we are playing, we are approaching it like playing the puzzle spot the difference. So if I give you five seconds to take a look at the two images that I'm showing uh, on the screen and ask you quickly identify those five differences Let's see how many of you are able to do that. So here are the images. I'll wait for five seconds. Hopefully you got all of them. And these were the differences. In fact, there were six differences, not five. How many of you got these? How is this relevant to what we are doing? Because we are testing software products, right? We are not testing uh, between the images, what is the differences in the images. We are testing software products and software products are different than the type of images that I showed because software products have got text, it has got images, it has got responsive design, there are different form factors, the user experience is different. And in fact, it is different because the product under test has got some context. This is not a static site uh, that we are talking about. 
it is a dynamic product based on the context of the user based on the different actions possible the product is going to behave differently and if that is the case then we are not looking at two images for comparison we are looking at two different screens of our software product whether it's a website or native apps we are trying to look at these screens and figure out what is the difference between these two and that is the type of testing we do at the last stage after all your automation has also completed executing in fact this is incorrect we don't look at the left side which is expected and the right side which is what you are seeing on screen this is not how we approach it we in fact just get one screen to look at this is what the product is looking like right now how does it compare with what was expected and in memory you are trying to figure out is this product is this page looking as expected uh as per design or as per requirement and you are doing this very quickly you have to repeat this across various different browsers and viewport sizes and devices with different types of data potentially and you are doing it at a fast pace a bigger problem also over here is that long pages can create a big uh, problem as well how do you really test if the full page is being rendered correctly if all the details are seen as expected it is a huge challenge so what does this really mean right this means that we are looking at our product the top layer of the product we are doing this manually we are trying to figure out in the short time what is going on what is missing over here in the product as per expect and we are trying to ensure that what was working before is continuing to work now as well all of this is happening manually and that is the problem that is the big gap why a lot of issues escape to production and all of those issues that we saw again going back to those examples for a little bit those exam uh, those issues could be because of just user experience or rendering issues but a lot of those issues could be because of functional issues as well and the functional issues manifest in the rendering getting broken in various ways which is not coming up as expected so all those examples it's a combination of functional and visual issues that we are really seeing and that is what really we are talking about is we need to find out how to get visual testing fit into your test strategy that is a missing piece of the puzzle that can give us a lot of value and once we now understand that visual testing is what is a missing piece the next uh, statement that we need to think about is how can we add automation visual automation in your test pyramid that can give you good value that is what this session really is about how can you add visual testing in your test strategy and how can you leverage the power of ai to do that but before we get into the solutions itself let's understand visual testing a little bit more so visual testing as we've seen these examples earlier is mostly done manually you have to look at the way the screens are rendered to take decisions on it and it's a human who has to take a look at it apply the context of the product the journey uh, what that test is about and decide if what you are seeing is right or wrong there is some aspect of how functional automation can be enhanced to help over here but that is that can help in a very limited way and we'll see some examples of that going forward as well okay but we do understand hopefully by now that if visual testing is not done what is the impact of it we saw from various examples earlier that there is a chance that depending on the context of the product of course there is a business or a revenue loss the amazon example the ups example the uh, southwest airline example spicejet airline example the banking examples right users the consumers the end users might get suspicious or will feel very con, uh, cautious should i be using this product if it is not being seen correctly so there could be a potential revenue loss there can also be a brand and credibility loss spotify for example right it was a music playing uh, app or the financial times uh, media website there is not a very big loss from a revenue perspective if certain screens are broken visually but users will start thinking this product does not look neat and clean and maybe i should find some other better option 
So it's a brand and credibility loss and credibility because when certain things do not work well for the users, users will complain. They will rant out on social media, which is a big problem, which is a big impact on the credibility of the product. And that's a big problem. And the last, which is also very, very important challenge uh, if visual testing is not done, is that users will start moving on to other products similar in the domain and get value from those instead of your product. And that's a big problem. So all of these in combination get impacted. All of these reasons uh, become a reality if your product is released with user experience issues, with functional issues uh, to production. And we need to change that. So, OK. Let's say we understand that visual testing is important and we need to do that. What are the challenges of doing visual testing before we get into the solutions itself? Okay. There are some major challenges. Visual testing is not new for that matter, right? It's been around for a good five to 10 years at least, and it is growing in popularity because of the value that uh, it is able to generate. But what are the main challenges when it comes to doing visual testing? One is about it is done manually. And it is done manually because uh, it is, of course, tedious. It is very error prone. Uh, and it is impossible to scale and repeat. Why? Because you are getting a new build very quickly these days. We are using CI and CD. Uh, and you need to repeat this manual activity every time. It is not possible to scale up. And we also saw that functional automation might help a little. For example, if you have Selenium-based automation or Appium-based automation for native apps, you can probably enhance the capability of automation tool to verify certain other aspects on the screen as well. But you would need to write a lot of code to verify a little bit more. And I'm going to show these things to you in the demo very shortly. So with these challenges, how can we really make visual testing a solution for us without having to worry about the challenges? So how does visual testing work? First of all, you start by creating a baseline. Baseline is what is expected of your product in the context of that test. That is your golden copy. That is the expected uh, way uh, the product is supposed to look and feel, present itself to the end users. Once you have the baseline, when you run the test again, against a new build, you will come take the screenshots again, and then you will compare the relevant screenshot with the baseline and ensure that there is no difference found over there. Your product is working as expected when compared to the baseline. This you can do for the whole page. Whole page again is what is seen on the screen or you could scroll and take the full page screenshot and check. Or you could also do snippets of the page. I just want to check the title of this particular slide, for example, right? It's a snippet of the page. It's not the whole page. You could do it in that fashion as well. So that is a second aspect, right? You created the baseline and then you're comparing the baselines. But your product is a living, breathing product. It is going to undergo changes. And when it undergoes changes, you need to update the baseline because now your product expectation has changed and you need to update the baselines to ensure that your product is behaving correctly as a uh, as per expectation of new features, functionalities that I've added. So this is typically how visual testing would be done. You create a baseline, you compare it with uh, the new tests that I've run with the baseline and uh, everything fine, great. If not, you found a problem. And as your product evolves, you would update the baselines. What are the challenges of automating this? It sounds easy, right? I have to take a screenshot, compare it, and uh, update the baseline. What are the challenges over here of this approach? I would focus on three main challenges. The first one is about creating the baseline itself. The way your product looks and feels to uh, present itself to the user could be slightly different on each different browser or device. And of course, it is going to be different based on different viewport sizes because our products are responsive in nature. If it's a native app, an uh, app 
running on a device with four inch screen is gonna be different, five inch screen is different, six inch screen is different, tablets, the rendering is different. The look and feel is different. Even though it is just scaled, uh, it is still different. You cannot really compare it and see that. So you need a unique baseline for each of the type of screen that you want to do the validation for. Also, it is contextual. I cannot just take a design from my designers for a particular page and compare it because the designers are not going to give me all the right type of data, which is going to be used by my test to do the validation. They might have different images or different content over there. And creating the baseline from a mock or wireframe can be challenging from that aspect because your product has got context. The second aspect is about maintaining and updating the baseline. You create, you have spent a lot of effort in creating the baseline for all the different browsers, devices, viewport sizes. As your product evolves, you need to repeat the same again, at least for the relevant screens to make sure your baselines are updated with the product expectation. And that can be a big challenge as well. The third thing, of course, once the infrastructure or logistic aspect is taken care of, is the accuracy of comparison. You want to ensure the comparison can happen with your contextual data, the dynamic data that is present in your product and the responsive design of your product. And you still should be able to do an accurate comparison. And this is where most of the tools in the market will fail because they are based on pixel comparison. And the minute you say pixel comparison, it has to be a static page with which you're doing the comparison. Only then it will work. Anything that is out of the ordinary, even a small pixel difference, the test would start failing. And that is where the standard approach of uh, pixel based testing would not work. So how does AI fit into this? How can you leverage the power of AI in visual test automation? And let's look at this in the context of a simple example. <clears throat> this is a simple login page. And needless to say, a simple expectation of this page is if I have not given the username and password and I click on the sign in button, I should get validation errors. Username is required, password is required for login. These error messages would potentially be seen in different text, uh, different colored text, different position. It might have some additional indicators where you need to fill in the data. There could be a lot of information to help the user provide the right information for signing in. Now, if you have to do a Selenium based automation for this type of a test for login, you would potentially have a code like this, where you've got one line of code for navigation, go to that particular URL, one button click, which is going to click the sign in button. And then you're writing a lot of code to do the validation, what should happen? What are the different types of errors that you would see? You're validating if all of those are seen or not. Now to implement this type of a test, which has around 18 lines of code and 21 locators and labels from the screen, the simple screen, it can easily take an hour or more because you have to identify all these locators labels. You will write the test. You will rerun it multiple times to make sure everything is fine before saying, yes, my basic login test is working. But now after you have written this test, if you get a new build and the new build has got evolved functionality for login page, what might end up happening is your test will fail because it has got a lot of issues. And the test will definitely catch issues like the default text. Instead of enter your username, you're saying, please enter name. Instead of enter your password, you're saying, please enter password. Your test will catch these issues, but it would not catch all of these other issues that are potentially there on the new build where images are missing. There is overlapping content. There is new features added as well you would not know that. And that's a huge problem. You spent more than an hour writing this test in the new build itself. You have got a few changes and the test has failed. In fact, both of these issues wouldn't, will not be caught because what you have over here is you're using assertions. The first assertion that fails, 
the test is going to stop over there. You would not even find both of these issues reported by the standard way of doing the automation. So, but what you might end up doing after seeing this build and the results, you would spend another hour uh, trying to enhance this test to add more coverage, to add more validations to this. Some of these additional validations you will be able to do. Many others you will quickly give up because it is not possible. For example, if the image is not available, if there is overlapping content, you would not be able to find these types of issues in the standard way of automation. And that becomes a problem because now you have spent more than two hours trying to build this simple test. You're not even able to catch all the different types of issues that are there. There are a lot of false positives that you have uh, encountered in this type of test. And that is not very valuable. A big challenge over here is also any of the locators could change, which is another issue why your test can fail because you have a lot of locators that you have specified in this particular screen, in this particular test, sir. Right? So that is a big problem. So let's take another uh, look at how this could have been approached instead. Instead of, we're still using Selenium. We still have the same line of navigation, the same line to click on the button. But now instead of all those different assertions that I had, the 18 lines of assertions that I had, I have one call to eyes.check window. And what is eyes? This is using an example of Apple tools, visual AI, where it is going to help do the full functional and visual validation for us in a single call. So what does this mean? This type of a test will hardly take a couple of minutes to create instead of a full hour. There is just one locator instead of 21 locators. So of course the speed is going to increase. And if I have to run this type of test against that old build and the new build that we saw earlier, we will see all the differences that were there from the baseline, the original screen are highlighted in pink over here for your perusal. You will find functional issues. You will find visual issues. You will find text changes, which are functional. Again, any new features that were added are also reported to you because you want to make sure the new features are also seen correctly. This way you will be able to find all the issues that exist on the screen by just writing a test in a couple of minutes. So what this means is even if you just take that first test that we wrote, not updating it. The first test, instead of 60 minutes, we have got a couple of minutes to uh, take, to write the test and take decision on those as well. We did not have to spend another hour trying to update that test just by taking quick actions, which we will see shortly in the demo. We are able to take decisions about what is a failure, what is acceptable and move on from there. So what we are really talking about is how visual AI in combination with our existing functional automation can help provide a lot of value to the teams to take decisions. You'll be able to write tests 40 times faster. Your tests are going to be extremely stable because you're using fewer locators. You'll be able to detect all the defects that are there in the new builds and take decisions on those. Nothing will go missing by using this approach. So the quality of your product increases because now you know automatically what is the difference in the new build versus the old. And there are no false positives over here. Using the AI algorithms, you'll be able to really figure out what is going on and work accordingly. So what this means is, the visual assertions that are there, the functional automation still remains the same, but a single line of code can do your full screen validation, which validates the UI and the UX. It does not break when the UI changes. That is a locator's change. We do not care. The visual validation, the AI engine uh, figures it out based on the rendering. It does not look at the locators to really uh, do the validations. There are no special coding skills required to create and maintain the baselines. 
This approach also allows for very seamless scaling of your execution as well. And there are many ways, more than 60 different SDKs available from which you can choose to do the integration to get this type of value. So this visual AI that we are talking about is from Apply Tools. They are the creators of visual AI. They help teams re uh, release perfect taps at a faster pace and at a reduced cost. And the way this works is they are using the power of the computers to replicate what the human eye and brain can see and do. The computer is taking very quick decisions and presenting all the data to you. So you can quickly apply your human mind, apply the context and take decisions to make your product quality better. You don't have to go finding the needle in the haystack or play the puzzle spot. The difference is it's good as a puzzle. It's not good at work. The AI technology helps us do that. So at the core of the Apply Tools visual AI platform is the visual AI engine. And the way it is designed, it helps work with teams on in any different way of working, any different tech stack that they have. And it helps, it is designed to work with the CI CD implementations. There is also a very interesting aspect from a scaling perspective because it is not sufficient to just run the tests uh, for a single browser or a single device. You want to be able to scale your execution for all different browsers and devices that are supported and get very quick feedback from those. The ultra fast test cloud that uh, Apply Tools has allows you to scale seamlessly by running the test on a single machine. So let's look at the demo of how Apply Tools does this. So what I have is over here a simple selenium test which just goes to some demo website right now and it is doing some clicks it is a very simple one but in this test i have integrated apply tools where when i create my driver my browser driver. I'm also initializing Apply tools with what algorithm do I want and uh, whatever configuration details that I want. I'm initializing that in the before each method. So this is boilerplate code. In my test itself, whenever I want to do visual validations, I'm going to call methods like eyes.check window, eyes.check and so on. And the test would run. At the end of the test, in the after method, when I'm closing the browser, I'm going to get the visual results from there as well. So when I run this type of a test, I've just launched it right now. The browser has launched. As I said, this is a very simple test, but it demonstrates the capability very, very uh, well. So we are doing some actions over here on the screen. We are going to do some clicks. And what happens is, as this is going on, in the Apply Tools dashboard, we will start seeing the results of this test come through. Now I'm running on a free account. That's why I'm going to the public cloud, which is in the other part of the world from where I am located. So there is network latency issues right now for me. But once this has happened, this has run, we'll see the results of this test in the Apply Tools dashboard. Then, and all of the check window calls that we did, we will see the results of that come up over here. The green indicates there is no difference found. The orange indicates there was a difference found and we want someone from the team to come and take a look at what is going on over here. So let's understand what, how Apply Tools does this. Instead of this example, I'll show you some other interesting examples. 
Let's take an example of a finance app. This is a Yahoo finance app, and this was run on an Android device. Over here, if I take a look at the differences, if I highlight the differences, you will see there are a lot of differences highlighted in the baseline, which is on the left-hand side, and the screenshot, which is there on the right-hand side. Now, these differences, if you observe, they are based on the data differences that are there. This comparison is happening using the strict algorithm. The strict algorithm says, whatever is different to the human eye, show that as a difference to me. So if I toggle between the screenshot and the baseline, you would notice whatever is different to the human eye, that is being highlighted as a difference over here. Hence, these differences are seen. So let's see what other algorithms could be there. If I use a layout algorithm, layout algorithm says, I don't care about the content. Tell me if the structure of my page or structure of my screen is the same or not. In this particular case, all the data differences have been hidden, but there is one difference that is found by the AI algorithm, the layout AI algorithm. There is something missing in this particular label or the button over here. So in this particular case, as a team member, I think this is a defect. There should be content over here. So I'm going to report this as a defect. And if I have a Jira or a Rally or any other test case, uh, defect management system integrated with Apply Tools, I can directly create this as a defect in that defect management system. And at this particular point in time, I can do a thumbs down. When I do a thumbs down, now this is marked as failed. So once this happens, now you are able to move on quickly. Imagine you having to do this manually every time. You would not know, you would be lost between the dynamic data and what is genuinely different in your test, in the screenshot that was captured. There is also another very interesting thing that uh, you could do over here. You might say that I want to use the strict algorithm. Show me any day or differences that you see, show that to me. But there's a certain section for which I cannot control the data that is seen. So in that particular case, I can mark a region over here and say, this is a region where I do not, uh, I want to use a different algorithm for comparison. And that is the layout algorithm I have used. And when I use the layout algorithm, you would notice that the region that you saw a lot of pink differences have been replaced by just one issue that we had found in the layout algorithm. So this can become a very powerful way for you to use a combination of algorithms based on the context of your product of each particular screen and use that in the most powerful way that gives you the biggest bang for the buck. You could also say, I want to ignore certain regions. This region I want to ignore because I don't care. This could be an ad, for example, that is shown, right? You cannot control what ad is going to be displayed over there or not. So I'm going to ignore those regions. And you can use as many of these as you want. And there's going to be a single comparison done in using a combination of these algorithms whenever the test runs the next time. The floating region is also very interesting where you can, when you selected a region, it drew two boxes around it. You can adjust the size of the boxes. And what this really means is as long as the inner box is within the bounds of the outer box, this should not be considered as a difference, as a failure. So you can use a combination of these algorithms to get a lot of value from your testing, depending on the context of your testing. Like, let's look at some additional examples. Here is an example of comparing a Chrome browser with Internet Explorer. Let's look at a standard visual testing mechanism. If I do a pixel-based comparison, the exact algorithm is a pixel-based algorithm. At a pixel-based algorithm level, if you try to do the comparison, the whole screen is shown as a difference, even though it does not seem like there are so many differences on the screen. 
But because each browser renders a page in a different way, even though it's a static page, it is rendering it in a different way, you would not be able to see uh, only the differences that matter to you. Each pixel that is different is reported, and hence the whole screen is reported as a difference over here. However, if you use the strict AI algorithm, you would notice that genuinely what is different to the human eye is marked as a difference. In this particular case, because you are comparing two different types of browsers, each having their own different rendering engines, the strict algorithm also might not be the right algorithm to use. So over here, you could potentially use the layout algorithm. And the layout algorithm says, ignore whatever the differences are, the visual differences are in terms of content or rendering that is there. As long as the structure of my page is the same, that is okay. And in this case also, we noticed that there is something in the bottom right hand side of the page, which was found and Applitools has reported that to you as a difference found. So your test, functional test could have been about get free pricing, but just because you did an eyes.check window, you are seeing there's something else which is not working correctly as expected on the screen and you are getting increased test coverage automatically. So now over here again, you can report this as a defect, fail this test and move on. I'll quickly show you some other examples as well. This is a good example for localization. I'm comparing two different language login screens for Facebook and at a layout algorithm level, it is reporting only one difference because it is saying this particular text is moving beyond the bounds of this text box. And that is an error from a layout perspective. That is a problem. However, if I use the strict algorithm over here, you would notice that whatever is again different to the human eye, everything is highlighted except this particular network image and the Facebook logo. Everything is highlighted as a difference over here. So you can choose the algorithms in the context of how you want to do this testing. Here's another example of a media website where it is marked in green, it is marked as past because we use the layout algorithm. If again, I use a strict algorithm, you will see all the content differences, whether it is text, images, does not matter. All these content differences are shown as a difference away. Okay. Now, this is about how AI can help and the combination of algorithms can help in doing better validation. The combination of algorithms that I showed can very easily be achieved in your test itself. And in fact, it is recommended to do this in your test itself, because now you can tell very accurately what type of comparison you want when your test is executing and the results are automatically going to show accordingly. But I want to now talk about scaling. How do you really scale this? We ran the test on a Chrome browser, but my product is used by Chrome, Firefox, Edge, uh, Safari, and so on, and on different devices as well. So there is a, a very interesting feature called ultra fast grid, where in the same test, you can also specify all the different browsers and uh, the different devices that you want in your test. And then when you run this test, you would see the results in the Applitools dashboard, how this would be seen. So I ran this test just before I started uh, doing this session and that single test we see has resulted in all these different test executions happening simultaneously, automatically. And you will see why this is important. If I just expand on these a little bit, you would notice that even with the small thumbnails, you can notice there is a difference in the way the pages are rendered. So what Apple Tools does is it does an apple to apple comparison using a combination of five different parameters. It automatically figures out what should be your baseline and do the comparison automatically with that. The same thing, what is there for the browser? Applitools also has this uh, new feature that is coming. It's in beta right now that works for native applications as well. I have this contacts application test on an iOS uh, device. I ran the test on my single iOS um, uh, simulator right now. And when I ran the test, the results I see this is uh, was executed on iPhone 8 and iPhone 10, whereas I ran my test on iPhone 12 Pro. So using the ultra fast grid, I can scale my execution and see how my native applications are also behaving on different versions of devices and operating systems and get the feedback automatically. So you're running the test once and getting feedback from all the different supported executions 
in the same test execution. Remember, the test is not actually running on all these different devices. It is rendering that is happening automatically on all these devices. There's a difference between running the same test on all versus rendering the same test on the same screens on all the devices. It is extremely fast to do it that way and you get the feedback. There is also something you could do for Android applications. This is for the DuckDuckGo application where I ran the test on one Android uh, emulator. I ran the test on an Android emulator and I saw the results for three different devices uh, automatically as part of the same test execution. So this approach can become uh, extremely valuable in your scaling uh, perspective. So how does the ultra fast grid really work? We saw the test that was there, right? You have your Selenium or APM or any tool that you are using, automation tool, you have integrated Apply tools with that. You run the test on that single browser or the single device in your local environment. Whenever you do a check window, Apply tools will capture the context of uh, that particular screen, send it over to the ultra fast grid where it will render the same page automatically on all these different supported, uh, all the different browsers and devices that you have selected and you will get the results back as part of the same test execution. The same thing would happen on the uh, native apps as well, where the view hierarchy and the resources are captured for each check window. It is sent to the ultra fast grid uh, where the rendering would happen and the results are coming back. That way you will be able to get, uh, you will be able to scale extremely fast and this all can work as part of a same CI execution strategy. You do not need to do anything different. You do not need any other port opening or firewall changes to support this type of behavior. So to wrap up, we saw the different challenges that we had for visual testing. We can automatically create these baselines and this is done by apple to apple comparison, not comparing a red apple to a green apple, but comparing a red to a red, a green apple to a green apple for each different browser device viewport size combination. And this is contextual in the test execution. A simple way to update the baselines, which I did not show. So if, for example, this was a difference found over here and I just do a thumbs up, that screen is now marked as passed and I save it, my baseline gets updated. So doing a simple uh, thumbs up updates the baseline and you are set the next time the test runs, it will compare it with the new baseline. The accurate comparisons, the AI algorithms actually are, uh, have executed over more than 1.5 billion tests uh, so far. And that has a proven accuracy of 99.49%. That means you can be rest assured there are no false positives that you will get as part of your test execution. So this is all good though, right? This is a great tool which complements your functional automation and gives you much more increased coverage at a very fast pace as well. But just integrating visual testing with your automation is not sufficient. You need to have a good test automation strategy. You need to know which screens need what algorithm, what combination to use, and that is also going to be important. Which browsers and devices you want to run your test, visual tests as well, that is also part of the strategy. So you need to think about the strategy as well. The other part that you uh, hopefully is evident now is now your test automation pyramid also includes user experience validation in an automated fashion, which was a big gap, which was a cause for a lot of issues escaping to production. So you need to be able to do that. And hence your product quality also is a combination of user experience validation. And that's how you will get increased coverage. That is how you will be able to scale to the next, evolve to the next level of automation using AI as part of your functional automation itself. With that, I would like to wrap up. Here are some of the references uh, for you to take a look at. And of course, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn, and we can have further conversations around visual testing or any other aspects of testing. I would love to hear from you, hear from your experiences, what has worked well or not, and uh, proceed accordingly. So again, uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And with that, 
I would like to say thank you for this opportunity. Hope everyone stays safe. Take care.